Well, good morning, beloved. Welcome to West Side. Wishing you Thanksgiving greetings. I pray that you're all healthy and safe and uh, are looking forward to a time of worship and, and uh, really digging into God's Word. Before we get started, just a couple of things. Uh, as always, a reminder about the giving. You can give online. You can mail it directly into our P.O. box, and all that information uh, is available to you. You can go to our Facebook page, or you can go to our web page to get that. Also, something special. Uh, tonight at 6 p.m., we are going to be hosting uh, a little gathering via Zoom uh, in lieu of what we normally do on this night, which is our Thanksgiving uh, potluck. We can't really do that now for obvious reasons, but we're still going to get together for a little bit of fellowship and some encouragement. Uh, I have a few things that I'm going to share, and you're going to have a chance to pray and just catch up with people. So it's real simple. You can go to our Facebook page, and there will be a link to the Zoom meeting, and you just click on that. It'll take you, and you can uh, join with us uh, Sunday night at 6 p.m. It'll last about an hour. Uh, or you can check your email, because I know Artie has sent out a bunch of invitations. So it, if you check your email and you're, uh, you're registered with us, you can get the link that way. But it's just going to be a great time, good opportunity to be encouraged together. And uh, heaven knows we could all use as much of that as we can get. All right, without any further delay, let's just go straight into worshiping our Lord. sin runs deep your grace is more where grace is found is where you you're my hope and stay Lord I need My 
What a wonderful time in worship. Now let's go into the Lord's word and allow him to speak directly into our hearts. Father, we pray this morning that you would teach us more about gratitude. Not just because it's the time of thanksgiving, Lord, but because this is such a vital aspect of our faith. If we don't understand the importance of gratitude, then we're going to really fall short of the full experience of what it means to interact with you because you are a great and gracious God and worthy of our praise, worthy of our thanksgiving. So speak this morning and just give us grateful hearts, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty, we're going to be concluding our series one by one, The Amazing Power of Gratitude. Last week we saw through the life of Jehoshaphat that God is our advocate and the key to that is having a thankful heart. This week we're going to take a look at another character from the Old Testament and we are going to learn about how gratitude is the key to God affirming our faith. And what you're going to see is that God will use our thankfulness to actually guide us in life. And that it is just absolutely central to being able to discern and understand what God wants you to do and when he wants you to do it and how he wants you to do it, it all flows from a thankful heart. And so with that, I would invite you to turn to the book of Joshua, chapter 4. And that's going to be the character we're going to be looking at 
And uh, I'm just going to give you a little background to begin. In Joshua 4, Moses is already dead. He's passed away, and now the time has come for God's people to enter into the promised land. They're going to be led by Moses' successor, uh, someone who has been his aide since he was a young man, Joshua. We're going to learn that Joshua was a descendant of Ephraim, and Ephraim was one of the two sons of Joseph. And we're going to see that that strong family lineage of faith has definitely been passed along to Joshua. And he has chosen to lead God's people because of his unflagging love for God. I mean, Joshua was, was one of the two spies, the only two, along with Caleb, who gave a good report on their first opportunity to enter into Canaan. So he had unflagging love for God. He had strong political and military leadership skills. I mean, he was a soldier, and he was very wise in dealing with people, and he had visionary faith. Joshua saw the grand picture from God's perspective. In Joshua chapter 2, before he is allowed to lead the people in, or actually before he leads them in, he's already allowed, but before he leads them in, he dispatches two spies to go into the land. Once again, you see Joshua repeating a lot of the things that Moses did because he learned from Moses. So he sends a couple of spies in, and they're designed to go and survey the first obstacle that the people are going to face, and that is the fortress city of Jericho. Uh, throughout Canaan, Jericho was really the crown jewel. It was considered their greatest stronghold of all the little city-states that were through the land there. Uh, Jericho was, was the one that nobody wanted to mess with. They were located about 15 miles north of Jerusalem, just above the top of the Dead Sea. But these two spies, when they get into the city, their presence is somehow detected and reported to the monarch. And so when that happens, a search begins, and these two spies are really in trouble if they get caught. Fortunately for them, providentially, from God's perspective, he picks someone to protect them. And of all people, he picks a prostitute. I told you before that our God will do things that surprise you. This is one of the bigger ones. He, he picks a prostitute named Rahab, who after hearing about what Israel has done since leaving Egypt, has heard about the greatness of their God and all of the miracles that he has performed. Rahab has responded with faith. You just never know who God's going to touch when he begins to get to work. And in this case, he changes a prostitute who lives in the city. She was uh, apparently a very wealthy woman. And so she's able to hide the two spies up on a roof underneath a bunch of, uh, of grain harvest there. And uh, while they're hiding up there, of course, the king comes and begins to question her. You know, those two spies, we know that they came to you. You know, tell us where they are. And she comes up with a very clever story to sort of divert the king and his, and his search party away from her and away from the city. And she negotiates with the two spies that she would hide them in exchange for her and her family being spared once the city inevitably falls to Israel, which was a fantastic uh, leap of faith on her part to be able to believe that this God from this foreign people that she doesn't know from Adam, was not only going to take them in to this area, but was going to deliver the city unto them. And that's exactly what would happen. Eventually, the spies lay low for a while until the search parties are far enough away, and then they head back to where Joshua and the people are camped on the other side of the Jordan River. And then these spies report to Joshua that the land is ripe for the taking, and that the people there are all afraid of them, which was something that Rahab had told these spies. And what a unique difference between these two spies and, and the majority of the spies that first went into the land and came back terrified and wanting to go back to Egypt. These two spies come back to Joshua and they say, oh man, time to move. God is at work. So the very next day, we're told, Joshua, who was heartened by their report, musters the people, and begins marching them toward the eastern bank of the Jordan River. Now, they were camped a little further inside of what would today be modern Jordan. They come 
to the eastern bank of the river, which is right at the Dead Sea estuary. It's where the Jordan River feeds into the Dead Sea. And at God's instruction, Joshua has the Levitical priests pick up the Ark of the Covenant and begin walking toward the, the bank of the river. And he gives them the instructions, and he says, you're going you're gonna to go to the edge of the water, and you're just going to keep marching into the river. And when you do, God's going to do something fantastic. And so they pick up the Ark of the Covenant and start marching toward the water. We're told that at this time that the water was at flood stage. I'll, I'll give you some more details about that later on. But basically, it was a swift running river that was already much higher and faster than it normally was. And we know that they go right to the edge of the water. It says as soon as they touch the water, the water begins to back away from them and to heap up in a pile upstream, about 15 miles upstream. And it dries out the riverbed sufficiently for the people to begin crossing. The priests, as they had been instructed, stand in the middle of this now dry riverbed holding the ark up on their shoulders for everybody to see. And as they stand there in the middle of this river with the ark, then Israel begins to cross, and, and, and they get moving. They don't dilly-dally. They, they, they keep going across on solid ground. Once everybody, and, it's, and you're talking about more than likely millions of people, even, even you know, just, uh, they were such a large nation at this point, that by the time they get to the other side and they're officially now in the promised land, Joshua sends 12 representatives back to where all of the priests are still standing in the middle of this dry riverbed. And he says, I want each of you to pick up a stone, something you can carry from the middle of the riverbed, pick it up and carry it out to the, back to the bank here because we're going to do something special with it. We're going to build a commemorative statue to what God has done here today. And we're going to do it in our new home on the west bank of the Jordan. And with that, we come to our passage today, Joshua chapter 4, starting at verse 15. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Command the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant law to come up out of the Jordan. The Ark of the Covenant, I don't really need to tell you a lot about that. If you've ever seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know more or less what it looked like. If you've ever read the scripture, uh, you know what an important symbolic and physical reminder it was of God's presence and his power. As a matter of fact, the Israelites were told when they crossed the Jordan to make sure they kept their distance from the Ark. Isn't that Amazing. Now, they're, they're, they're carrying the ark with them. It represents the presence of God. Normally, it stayed in the tabernacle in the most holy place. But now, it's out leading the way, and it's being carried by these sons of Aaron. Remember, I told you they were the only ones that could minister before God? So, they're carrying the ark. They were the only ones for whom it was safe to get anywhere near the ark, and even they had to be careful. You had to put poles through these rings that were on the side of the box, and you had to make sure you never touched the thing. And so they're carrying it up high. They're standing in the middle of the river. Behind them, water is piling up, stacking up in heaps like hay, it says. And as they're standing in the middle of the river, the people are marching by, but they are told to keep their distance. They're told, never come any closer than a thousand yards to the ark which tells you how holy the ark was. Now, the ark itself was just a box that was overlaid with gold and designed the way God had told Moses to make it. But God's presence upon the ark, that's what made it fearsome. And how many times do we see that in the scripture, that God is with us, but we need to keep a healthy respect for him. We need to always maintain a healthy respect and, re and healthy fear of him. And he's told... Uh, uh, excuse me, that Joshua is told that this is uh, the contract between God and his people, that it's the Ark of the Covenant of the Law. It's, it, the Ark represented God's promise. Inside the Ark were the stone tablets that Moses had brought down from the mountain. Now, not the first ones, because he got mad and broke those. Those were the ones that God himself had written. But the second pair that God dictated to Moses, and Moses had 
chiseled into rock, those were inside of the ark, and that was God's written contract to Israel. It was physical evidence, along with the ark itself and his presence upon it, that God was with them. God always gives us assurance that he's with us. His presence is always there for us to see. Verse 17, so Joshua commanded the priests, come up out of the Jordan. Come up out of the Jordan. Okay, everybody's safely across. We've got our stones for our monument. It's time for you guys to come up. Now, in this, we are going to see two amazing principles that are very ap applicable for you and I when it comes to the will of God and our interaction with the will of God. First of all, notice that the priests, after they're told by Joshua, who had been commanded by God himself, after they're told to go into the middle of this river, now first they're told, go to the river. This river is streaming through here. I mean, it is screaming through. They're, they're told, don't stop, just go to the water and just keep walking. Now, when they hit the water, the river is just the way it had been. But as soon as they touch it, we're told, it begins backing away from them as fast as it can. Why? Because they were so fearsome? No. They had something on their shoulder, the presence of God. All of nature even has respect and fear for God. So it, the water, as soon as they touch it, whoa, moves away from them. And then they go to the middle of the river, which I'm sure was a bit surreal. And now the people cross, but the entire time that the people cross, the priests were told, stand still and don't move. They stand still and they do not move, even though they are in what, from a human perspective, would be a rather precarious situation. What happens if all of a sudden the water starts rushing? Now you've not just got the normal depth of the water and speed of the water that you would have to deal with, but you would have essentially a tidal wave hit you. They're standing in the middle of harm's way and they're not moving. Also, notice this. They're the last ones to get to cross. Every other single person in Israel gets to cross ahead of them while they stand and wait in harm's way. Now, what do we learn about God's will from that? Well, first of all, let's ask ourselves, why did they do what they did? One, they had been commanded by God to do it, so they knew what God's will was. There was no ambiguity about that. Two, they knew that God's presence was with them. Why? Because they had it up on their shoulders. Can you imagine what it must have been like to have God's presence up on your shoulder? Well, you should, because the Bible says that if you're born again, you have God's presence in your heart. And then lastly, they stood their ground and allowed everybody to go across because they knew that their role was as a servant. And servants don't think of themselves first. They think of others in service to God. What an amazing thing these priests are teaching us here. So what does that tell us about God's will? It tells us this. When God reveals to you where he wants you to be and what he wants you to do, you're to remain there in peace, but to remain there, stand your ground, until he tells you different. So many people come to me and say, Pastor, well, how do I know if it's God's will if I do this or do that? My first question is, have you consulted with him? Because most of the time, we just assume that whatever we want to do, that's God's will. But it isn't necessarily. As a matter of fact, I would argue just the opposite. Most of the time, our, our in instincts about things are typically wrong. Jeremiah says that our heart is, is deceitful. You have to seek the Lord to know what he wants you to do. But once you know it, and, and he does reveal those things to those who seek to know, the Bible says you stand your ground. Well, what if, I'm, what if I'm in harm's way? What if standing here could be dangerous? You stand your ground. Well, how come everybody else is getting to go first and I'm stuck here? You stand your ground. When God tells you to do something, you do it. Second part of the verse, Joshua commanded the priests come up out of the Jordan. And here's the second part of understanding how God's will works. As soon as God tells Joshua and Joshua tells the priests that it's time to come out, they come out. 
Now let's look at it from the reverse perspective. Can you imagine what it must have felt like to come to the edge of the water carrying this ark? The minute your foot touches it, the water runs away from you. Something water doesn't do. It runs away from you and can't get as far enough away from you. It's 15 miles upstream and everything's dry beneath you. The Dead Sea isn't being fed with water anymore. Why? Because you put your foot in the water. God used you to do something amazing. And not only that, but as long as you're standing in the river, no water is coming. You're in the middle of God doing something miraculous and powerful. These guys probably were beaming with smiles, sitting there thinking, this is incredible. We are standing in the middle of the Jordan River. And it has stopped flowing. And as long as we're standing here, it isn't going to flow. Sometimes God will do amazing stuff in your life. Sometimes you'll be in the middle of a period where God is just absolutely blessing you and revealing himself to you, and it just feels like it's the greatest thing in the world. But guess what? Eventually, it comes to an end. Eventually, God says, it's time for you to move on. And notice that as soon as the command is given, they turn and they start marching toward the bank. They don't delay. They don't reminisce. They're not sitting there being nostalgic. They're not crying out saying, can we stay a little bit longer? They're not beating a dead horse. As soon as God tells you that it's time to move on, then it's time to move on. What is the key? How do I know whether it's time to stay or whether it's time to move on? You have to listen for his voice. That's why our relationship with him is key. You're not going to find it hidden in some secret verse somewhere. You know, that if you understand the Hebrew, it's going to give you, you know, communication that nobody else is getting. You're probably not going to get a burning bush the way Moses did. But you have the spirit of God within you. And when he reveals to you what he wants to do, which he will, he will personalize it. If your relationship with him is what it should be, then you'll know whether it's time to stand your ground or whether it's time to get up on out of there. What an amazing truth. Verse 18. And the priest came up out of the river carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. No sooner had they set their feet on the dry ground than the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and ran at flood stage as before. What you're going to find here is that this miracle at the Jordan River parallels what happened at the Red Sea with Moses and the people there. There's this, this aspect to God doing miracles that always involves us. Now, does God need us to do a miracle? Absolutely not. God created the heavens and the earth very nicely without us. But he involves us in what he's doing because he wants us to have our faith in him built up. We'll get to that in a minute. And it says that no sooner had they got to the dry ground on the other side of the riverbank that, boom, the water came flowing behind them. Just the same way as it says in chapter 3 of Joshua, no sooner had they touched the water on the east side of the river that it backed away from them. Every single time God does a miracle, he involves his people. In the case of the Red Sea, it was Moses with faith watching the water part. In the case, and then fold in behind them when it was time. Same thing here. God's giving this generation their own little miracle, very much in keeping with the original miracle that he had given the people who were with Moses. As soon as they touched it, it bookends so that their faith can be built up. And it teaches you that God requires active faith from us. Remember with Jehoshaphat last week? It says as soon as they headed out and started singing, God sprung his trap on their enemies and dealt with them. There is a sense in which, as we're sitting around waiting for God to do something, it's a very real possibility that he's waiting for us before he pours out what he has already preordained to do. Active faith, beloved, not passive. And it says that it went back to the way it was, which was at flood stage. I did some research on this. During the spring, which is when this happened, 
uh, because the Hebrew calendar is different, and we know that this is the first month of their calendar year. It's in the spring, uh, Nisan, they call it. Uh, during this time, melt off from the mountains, from the Judean mountains, really flows heavy and causes the Jordan River uh, to, to go a lot faster and wider than it normally does, which means that the river at this time was somewhere between 100 and 125 feet wide and 10 to 15 feet deep and extremely cold and swift. Uh, think of maybe the King's River when it's really rolling, when the water's really high. I've rafted the Kings in the past and it's a little spooky sometimes, that water gets moving. And so here they were, when they, when they approached the water, it was daunting. When they got to the other side and it started really moving behind them again, daunting. It required faith. This was a genuine obstacle in their way. Verse 19, on the tenth day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan and camped at Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho. Now again, we know it's on the tenth day of the first month. This was Nisan. In the Hebrew calendar, this is five days before they celebrate Passover, right around the time that we celebrate Easter. And you also need to know that by every indication in the scripture, they have not celebrated Passover for 40 years. They celebrated the original Passover in Egypt, and since that time they have been wandering in the wilderness and have not celebrated Passover. And yet we're told in the very next, chap next chapter of Joshua that they are going to celebrate Passover, and they're going to celebrate it in the new promised land, which was what God had intended all along. Had they obeyed Moses at the original precipice of the land, they would have celebrated Passover in Egypt one year, and the very next year would have celebrated in their new land. But because they were disobedient, 40 years missing out on celebrating God's mighty work. And now here they are in this new place. And they're going to celebrate Passover, we're told. We're also told that when they camp in this ground, they're going to eat their first food in the new land. They're going to find some grain and make some food from it. And they're going to eat of the, what you would call the first fruits of their new home, this new land. And guess what stops right after they eat? The manna. God no longer needs to provide for them through the manna because he is now provided through the fulfillment of his promise. Now, Gilgal, that name is a Hebrew name. This place was nondescript. It's, it's in the, the Judean wilderness. Uh, it was about two miles north of Jericho, and this becomes their new campground, their new base of operations. And they're the ones who name it. It later becomes an important shrine to the Israelites, and you'll see why in a minute, and it also becomes a city. And uh, the name itself, Gilgal, means round or circular. You'll see why that's significant in just a second here. Verse 20, And Joshua set up at Gilgal the twelve stones they had taken out of the Jordan. It is believed that the monument that Joshua builds from these 12 stones that were taken out of the middle of the Jordan as, as a reminder of the miracle. The stones themselves were the reminder of the miracle because they couldn't have been fished out of there unless God had moved the water. So these 12 stones represent to each one of the tribes of Israel. Each stone is their personal reminder. They may have even etched their name or their family crest or something on each one of these stones, but it says that the name of the city, Gilgal, or the place, Gilgal, means circular. So most theologians believe that the monument itself was circular in nature. That it was what we would call a cairn, a stone monument. And it was established there, and it remained there for quite some time. The Israelites would actually visit there later on. We'll come to that in a minute. The name Gilgal may also tie to something else that happened in this place. We're told in the next chapter that God commands Joshua to circumcise all the people. Why, why would that be necessary? Well, the people had been originally circumcised uh, before under the command of Moses. But think about it. Forty years have passed 
while they were roaming in the desert. And while the adult males of that first generation had been circumcised, all of their children had not because they were roaming in the wilderness. And if they're not celebrating Passover, I guarantee you they weren't circumcising their children. And that's evidenced here because now as soon as they get into the land, God commands Joshua, make sure that you circumcised all the males so that we can remove the stain that's left over from Egypt. And what was the stain? The disobedience of their parents the unbelief of their parents. And that was evidenced in their children being uncircumcised. And so they go ahead and circumcise all the children and God uses a very nice play on words. He says, in this way you'll roll away your disgrace. It's interesting, uh, he says that in Joshua 5, 9. The word circumcised literally means to cut a circle. So that's why they called this place Gilgal. There was a circular stone monument and this is the place where all the Jewish men were circumcised so that now they are prepared to move into the land as God's distinct people and to be blessed in a way that would be fantastic. Verse 21 and 22. He said to the Israelites, In the future, when your descendants ask their parents, what do these stones mean? Tell them Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. Which means now that this became a shrine at Gilgal, that people would visit, sometimes just while traveling. Sometimes they would make a pilgrimage to this place, and every time they got there, they would have their children with them, and their children would ask, Dad, Mom, what are all these rocks here for? And the parents were told, when they ask, you tell them, this is a reminder, sweetheart, of what God did when we came to the edge of the Jordan. This was the gate the water gate that God swept open so that all of us could come in here. It's the obstacle that he removed, and these are the reminders. Tells you something. First of all, in ancient Israel, you need to understand that it was always viewed, and matter of fact, commanded by God, that the parents should educate their children, not just in the things they needed to get by in life, but about Israel's rich history and culture, and most importantly, about their faith about reverence for and the requirements of their God, Jehovah. And so this was just another life lesson for the children, which is a reminder to us that we are not only to instruct our children about the things of God, but to model it for them. And then the other thing it says is that Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. The Jordan River, as I told you before, represented the obstacle to God's people getting from where they were to where he said they needed to go and where they would be rewarded. That tells you that whenever God tells you to do something, whenever he gives you a command or a promise, there's always going to be an obstacle. There's always going to be an aspect of it that requires faith. Why? Because that's how God works. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. How else do you please an invisible God? With faith, something that's invisible. And so when the obstacle was there, they were faced with a faith choice, just like they were originally when they saw, you know, the fortified cities and freaked out and had no faith and turned on Moses and God says, I've had it with you. Well, now the next generation has got their own obstacle, but they've also got their own miracle, very similar to what the first crowd had. And now they're faced with a choice. Will you step into it or are you going to back away? There's always an obstacle to receiving God's promise. And this monument reminded them. It was an indication of their thankfulness for God delivering on his promise, which tells you that even though there will always be obstacles to receiving God's promise, if we act by faith, he will always neutralize them. Now, he won't sweep them out of the way. That's what we want. We want no obstacles. But that is not how God works. He always brings obstacles that can be dealt with only by faith. But once we do that, once we demonstrate faith, we don't need to fear or focus on the obstacles themselves. They are just a means to an end for God to build faith in us. And he will sweep the obstacles so that they can't touch us or hurt us or present any harm the same way he did with the water of the Jordan. When the Lord leads us, the path ahead will always be clear. Not free of obstacles, but free of any obstacle that can hurt us or stop us. You've got to remember that, beloved. 
Don't expect that, you know, you're going to find your way in life and there's not going to be any trials or any obstacles or any difficulties whatsoever. As a matter of fact, life is full of those things by nature itself. Plus, God brings extra ones in because he wants to test and build our faith. But when we act in faith, the obstacles become no more important than the water of the Jordan was, was even though it was flooding. Verse 23, For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. I love, listen to what it says. The Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you. I think the children that are being told this story initially were the ones that were too young to remember what happened, which says something to you parents. You have a responsibility to teach your children about the things God has taught you and shown you because they may have been born and may have been alive, but they likely won't remember. And it's our job to tell our faith story to our children to build their faith up. You know, we've lost an entire generation, more than one generation of young people. And you know why? Because parents are not doing this. Either A, they don't have any faith story to tell because they never demonstrate faith. Or B, they neglect to tell it because they forget it. They forget all of the great stuff God has done. That's why thankfulness is so important. It talks about how the Red Sea miracle was very similar to this miracle. And the only question was, would they believe? And in this case, and in this case, the people did believe. And so they saw great great power, for, not just from God here at the Jordan, but he had told them, listen, the way I'm going to dry up the Jordan here is going to give you assurance to know that the same God that can do this to the Jordan River, wait till you get to Jericho and see what I do there. Because you're going to see even greater miracles. I'm going to do for you what I wanted to do for your parents and your grandparents 40 years ago. I'm going to do for you what they missed out on because of their unbelief and their fear. Verse 24, he did this so that all the people of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. Why does God take Israel into the land this way? Why does he do anything that he does? I mean, we serve kind of a strange God. I've already told you, he has, he has things that he does that will surprise you. Why? Because he's trying to accomplish something that you and I most of the time aren't concerned with, but we ought to be. We ought to be. The two things that he's always concerned with is one, so that all the people of the earth, all of lost humanity that is not yet right now a part of God's family, he wants them to know something. There's something he wants to say to them. You know, it's interesting to me that most unbelievers don't believe in a God, and if they do believe in a God, they don't think that he ever interacts with us. How wrong they are. He is real, and he has a message for them. He has a message, and he will use multiple means, sometimes through just stories of great things that he's done, or we are his messengers. He wants the earth to know something. What does he want the earth to know? That his hand is powerful. God wants the earth to fear, to revere him, to put some respect on his name, to use the modern term. He wants the earth to know that he's powerful. And the fact that most people have no fear of God these days, no respect, no reverence for him, that is not because God isn't doing great things. It is because, frankly, we have failed. We have failed to live in such a way that we respect and fear God. We'll get to that in a minute. But also to communicate the amazing and awesome God that we serve to the lost world around us. Now part of that is just the sign of the times. People are becoming cold and, and turning away from the truth. And that's just, we're leading into the end times, I'm convinced. But I think we bear a great responsibility for not glorifying the God that we serve and to making him known to a lost world. But I'll tell you something. He's going to make his presence felt. In the days ahead, matter of fact, he is already making his presence felt. All God has done is flick the earth and look at the mess we're in. 
What would happen if he really got serious about showing us how powerful his hand is? He wants the earth to know how powerful he is. And I will tell you why in just a little bit. The second thing he's trying to accomplish is that, he says, so that you might always fear the Lord your God. Notice that he doesn't just want the world to fear him. He wants us to fear him. So that we might always fear the Lord. Now, it's a different kind of fear. But it's fear nonetheless. Do we? Do we fear our God? You know what's sad? Is that while, because of a steady stream of miracles and because of the amazing leadership of Joshua, this generation, in fact, did fear God from the beginning of their Canaan conquest to pretty much the end until they got settled in the land. But as soon as Joshua dies, and there's sort of a vacuum of leadership, and then the people get settled in the land and get fat and sassy in the blessing of God, their fear of him begins to die. Judges 2.10 tells us that. People no longer feared the Lord. Everybody did what was right in his own eyes, and it leads to disaster. Let's close it off here. Affirmation. What do we learn about God's affirmation of our faith through Joshua here? Well, first, we learn that part of his affirmation to us when we respond to what he's telling us to do by faith, part of that is that he makes a pathway. Verse 23, the Lord your God dried up the Jordan. That's what the parents were supposed to tell the kids when they asked about this circular cairn at Gilgal. They said, this circle here, this is made up of stones, and these are not just ordinary stones. Notice how smooth these stones are. You know what made them smooth? Water flowing over them. You know why? Because these things were on the bottom of the Jordan. And you know how we fished them out of there? Because it was dry. Because our God swept away the water with his presence. This monument is a reminder of the power of our God and the fact that he will always provide a pathway for those who seek him by faith. Again, it doesn't mean that we won't encounter any obstacles. It just means that those obstacles can't and won't stop us. Proverbs 2.8, he guards the course of the just and, pro and protects the way of his faithful ones. So the first aspect of the pathway that God provides for us, through thankfulness, by the way, through gratitude, Joshua marched the people to the edge of the Jordan and prepared to take them into Canaan. Why? Because the two spies had come back with a good report and had said, you are not going to believe what happened. We got into the city. We almost got caught. Guess who hit us? A prostitute of all people. And by the way, we made a deal with her. We'll tell you more about that later. But you also need to listen to what she told us. She said that from the king on down, everybody in that city of Jericho is scared, and not just them, but every other city in Canaan is frightened of us because they have heard about what our God has done. And Joshua, that's all he needs to hear, and he says, get ready, get ready, we're going to the Jordan and we're going in. God has now opened the door and it is time. We have been waiting for 40 years to get out of this desert. We are not going to delay. We're going straight in. God will always make a pathway for the righteous. He will always put you right where you need to go and take you right through any obstacles that are in the way. Beloved, believe him. Believe him. How many obstacles do we let whip us because we never have any faith? How many times do we walk around acting like we're paupers and life is miserable and we're not realizing that we're right on the edge of victory when they got to the greatest obstacle? It was the gate to where they wanted to go, not the barrier. Faith is the key that opens the gate. It's what turns a wall into a gate. Second thing we learn about God's affirmation through gratitude is that prominence, he wants his name to be prominent. He'll always make a pathway, but he wants his name to be prominent. What he does in our life is designed so that when other people hear about it, they put respect on his name. God magnifies his name. Why? Why does God want his name to be respected? Why does he want a lost world to realize that his hand is powerful? 
Because he wants to flex? Because he's, he's, he's an egotist and proud? Absolutely not. You and I know that. So why on earth does he care about what people think about his name? Two reasons. When people fear the Lord, two things happen. The first is it restrains evil. It restrains evil. You know why the world is as messed up as it is right now? Because there's no fear of God. Why is crime so high? There's no fear of God. Why are people so despicable to one another? Why are we afraid to go out at night? Why is the world such a dark and evil place? Why is the news so depressing? Because there is no fear of God. Fear of God restrains evil. Now listen, when I was a little kid, I'll tell you, there was two different ways I behaved. One was the way I behaved when I thought I was all by myself, and the other way was when my dad was around. And trust me, they were as different as night and day. When there's fear of God, it restrains evil. You know the second thing it does? It provides hope. Because you want to know what people out there want. Even if they say they don't believe in God, they want there to be a God. They've just been discouraged by life or by their own faithlessness, but they want there to be a God. They need there to be a God. They want to know that there's hope. Even if they stay unbelievers, they still want to know there's hope. Who alone can provide hope? A God with a powerful hand. That's why it's important, beloved, that we make the name of God great, even if people say they don't want that. They do, and they need it. It restrains evil. What a glorious thing. That's why God wants his name to be prominent, because we need his name to be prominent. Do you know how many times I hear from people when I tell them I'm a pastor, and they always say the same thing, well, I wish I could believe like that. You know what? They do. They do wish they could believe like that. You know why? Because they want it to be true. They need it to be true. Psalm 99.1, the Lord reigns. Let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim. Let the earth shake. Oh, beloved, if only... The people of earth revered the Lord the way the people of heaven do. Beloved, let me tell you a little secret. Even the devil fears the Lord, and so do his demons. You don't hear them sassy when Jesus shows up, when he reveals himself, when he speaks their name. They're fearful. The only things in the universe that don't respect God is us. And I think that breaks his heart. God will always provide a pathway. God wants his name to be prominent, and we need it to be prominent. And lastly, he wants us to have perseverance. So pathway, prominence, and perseverance. God wants us to fear him as his people. He wants us to fear him more than anything else. People, Christians get hung up. Well, why does God want me to fear him? Because for the same reason that he wants the lost to fear him. We need to know that there are absolutes, beloved. We need to know that there is a being who exercises control over everything. And so therefore, when we place faith in him, we're safe. He wants us to not just fear him once in a while or to fear him for a little while. He wants us to fear him all the while, from beginning to end. And we need that. Verse 24, so that you might always fear the Lord. Beloved, it is so important. It is so important. You know why we're so afraid of everything that's going on right now? Because our God is small, and we don't fear him. We don't fear how majestic he is. We don't have awe for him. And frankly, we don't have fear for him, but we need to. It says in Jeremiah 32, starting at verse 39, it says, I will give them, this is God speaking to his people, I will give them singleness of heart and action so that they will always fear me and that all will then go well for them and for their children after them. Listen to those two words. Singleness of heart and action. 
Remember, God is interested in active faith. He's not interested in theoretical faith or religious faith or situational faith. Active faith. Heart and action, just like James said. One without the other is meaningless. He wants us to have so much faith in him because our fear of him is so great that the way we think and the way we speak and the promises we make are validated by how we live. Wow! That's some serious affirmation. It all flows from thankfulness. It all flows from a heart of gratitude. That was the difference between this generation, beloved, and the original generation that Moses led. The original generation was led by fear because they weren't thankful. And why weren't they thankful? Because they kept forgetting, forgetting everything God did. Every time God did something special and miraculous for that first generation, all it did was make them complain about something else. They never stopped and said, thank you, Lord, for the manna. Thank you, Lord, for the water. Thank you, Lord, for the meat. Thank you, Lord, for the deliverance. Thank you for the Red Sea crossing. Thank you for the promised land that you're going to give us. They never said thanks. They always said, well, that may have turned out okay, but you know what? We still got a lot of problems here. It was attitude. They didn't have a thankful heart, which meant they were forgetting all of the great things that God was doing. They were forgetting them just as fast as they were happening. That's why Jesus refused to do miracles in the places, in the cities, even his hometown, that wouldn't believe. Because you're wasting your time doing something for someone who doesn't have a grateful heart. How would you like to have to keep giving gifts to somebody who never said thank you? God wants us to have a grateful heart. And he wants to provide. And he will provide if we exercise faith. Look at the difference of what happened to the first generation to what happens to this generation. There's an Israel today because of this generation. Think about how their choices affected not just them, but their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren. You talk about a legacy of faith. You talk about changing your family's narrative. Final story. The world will always be riddled with darkness and despair, but those who know the Lord, those who love the Lord, will always be cared for. God will always take you right where he wants you to go and bless you when you get there. In his book, Everybody's Normal, Till You Get to Know Them, pastor and author John Ortberg tells the following story about an amazing young believer named John Gilbert. At age five, John was diagnosed with Decane's muscular dystrophy, a genetic, progressive, and debilitating disease. Sadly, in 2012, at the age of 25, the disease finally claimed John's life. Before he passed away, however, he managed to type out his life story using only a mouse that he controlled with one partially functioning hand. In the story, he didn't just give his biography, but he also shared many faith lessons that he had learned and that he hoped to pass on to others. In the book, he tells of how every year the disease, the disease took something new from him. One year, he lost the ability to run, so he couldn't play sports with the other kids. The next year, he could no longer walk straight, so all he could do was sit and watch others play. Before long, he was stripped of many attributes that we would use to define someone else as human, including the ability to speak. But that wasn't the worst of the indignities that he experienced. During his school years, he suffered far more than what many children could bear or even imagine. Groups of students humiliated him because of his condition and because he had to bring a trained dog to school to help him. Worse yet, every day, a sadistic bully would abuse him mercilessly inside a lunchroom that had no supervising teachers. Not a single person ever stood up for him because they were too cowardly. What a silly species we are, John would later observe with his trademark grace. We all desperately need to feel accepted ourselves, and yet we constantly reject others. But not every moment in John's young life was miserable. In fact, there were glorious blessings filled with wondrous joy. To that end, he was once invited to attend an NFL fundraising auction as a guest. Before it began, a particular item had caught his eye 
a basketball signed by every member of his favorite NBA team, the Sacramento Kings. When the auctioneer finally came to the ball, the bidding was swift and heated. Looking on with enthusiastic desire, he suddenly felt his hand begin to slowly rise to join in. But his family didn't possess anywhere near the kind of funds necessary to participate, so John's mother gently lowered it back down as others looked on with compassion. Now watching in deflated silence, the price continued to rise again and again. Soon it reached an astronomical amount compared to both the value of the ball and even other items at the auction. But in the end, a well-dressed man simply stood up and tendered a bid so far above the others that no one else could counter. And with that, the item was his. After writing a check to the auction house, he confidently approached the front of the room to claim his prize. But instead of walking back to his seat, he continued down the aisle until he came to where John and his mother were seated. Without a word, he gently placed the ball into John's frail hands, smiled knowingly, and then returned to his chair. Summarizing his emotions, John later wrote, It actually took me a minute to realize what had just happened. I remember hearing gasps around the room, followed by thunderous applause and the sound of weeping. To this day, I'm still overwhelmed by his incredible act of kindness. Beloved, what a perfect image of how God supplies our need. I pray that you've been encouraged to develop a thankful heart, not just at Thanksgiving, but at all times, realizing just how amazing he is, how powerful, and that your reverence would lead to gratitude. Father, thanks again for your word. It stirs our heart. May we always be thankful for all that you do, Lord, and may you you allow us to be able to see clearly all that we miss, that our faith would be built up, that our fear would be pleasing to you, and that our path before us would be clear. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Happy Thanksgiving. We'll see you next time.